All right. One, two, three. We are his chosen people. We are his royal priesthood. We are his special possession. We are sanctified in Christ. We are his holy people, children of God. And because we are children, we are heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. We are blessed and all things work together for our good because we love him and are called according to his purpose. We are a new creation filled with his spirit, citizens of heaven. We are saints of God, justified, redeemed, and free. We are in this world, but we are not of it. We are its salt and its light. We are world overcomers. Amen. Amen. Uh, and I need you, to, <laughs> I want to reiterate this. This is what the Bible says about you. And as I, I'm, I, uh, I wrote this all down this morning, and I'm going to uh, actually put in where the scriptures are for each of those statements. And then we're actually going to come up with some kind of uh, card that you can take home that will also show you where those scriptures are. But we're going we're gonna to say this every week. Because I think it's important for you to have the right perspective in terms of how God sees you. Because many of those things that we just read, though the Bible says it clearly about us, many of us don't think of ourselves in that way. And if we're going to talk about perspective, which we're going to do shortly, then we at least need to also have a right perspective of ourselves. There's nothing worse than having the wrong perspective about you. There's nothing worse than having the wrong perspective about you if your perspective about you is lower than the one that God has about you. Amen. We're going to begin to memorize this. I'm excited, and I'm praying that this will get down in your heart and in your soul. See, perspective is about point of view. Perspective is about how you see something. Um, you know, you can see something and be looking at it and still not see it right. Your perspective can be skewed. Your perspective can be tainted. Your perspective can be off. Your perspective can be wrong. It's entirely possible to be looking at a thing and still not see it right. And what's even worse is you could be needing to look at a thing, but be looking at other stuff altogether. <laughs> oh, all right, let me, let me say it to you this way. Uh, you know that when you get married, a part of the commitment that you're making is to not look at anybody else the way you look at the one you're married to. There is a perspective and a focus, an exclusivity of focus that God designed for marriage to, to have between a husband and a wife. However, if someone spends their time using the focus they're supposed to have on their spouse with other people, the perspective about the spouse is off. And if the perspective about the spouse is off, then the intimacy that God designed for marriage to have is not any good. I got some that's true and amens right here. Everybody else is like, oh, Lord, help us. Hmm, 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 hmm. I'm going to begin a short two-part series today. And the series is entitled... Intimacy begins when adultery ends. Some of y'all ready to run. Some of y'all trying to, some of y'all looking at the door like, oh Lord. Intimacy begins when adultery ends. <laughs> oh, yeah, we haven't even gotten into it yet. We just, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, 
I've had you guys queue up James, and I want you to understand something about James, and it's important I mention this often whenever I get into a text uh, that's related to James. Um, This James who wrote the book of James in the Bible is the son of a couple by the name of Joseph and Mary. And this James had an older brother, and his name was Jesus. And this brother made a claim that he was the son of the living God, and that he was the promised Messiah that the Hebrews were waiting for. And this James, who wrote this book, didn't believe it. Because James saw this guy as, this is just my older brother. And so, this brother is eventually crucified, killed for the claim he was making about who he was. And James, the younger brother, has to deal with the pain of a mother who lost a son, but also the pain of losing an older brother. However, three days after his brother was killed, his brother resurrected from the dead. And after his brother was resurrected, James's perspective was shifted. Because he was aware that his brother had died, but now his brother is alive. So James decides... I think my brother was right. (laughs) I'm sharing this with you because when James writes, he writes with a bite. Because he has a different perspective than the other apostles. See, the other apostles wrote about this Jesus who suffered and died. But James is writing about his brother who suffered and died. So when he writes, his writing doesn't have the same kindness. Yeah, his his take on things, hmm, I don't want to call it more real, but just think about how you would feel if your brother suffered and died for faith. That you didn't believe. Later you were proven wrong. And now not only do you believe, but you even feel called to herald this faith. And you're doing so with a little bit of the bitterness on the inside about how your brother died. And not only that, but how you didn't believe him when he was alive about who he said he really was. So... When James writes, it can, he can be a little rough. And I like to warn everybody of that. Amen? Amen? All right, you've been warned. So here I want us to look at James chapter 4, verse number 4 together. And I'm going to read this to you. We're ministering today from this subject. Intimacy begins when adultery ends. James 4, verse number 4 says this, You adulterous people, see how he's starting here? You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scriptures say without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he's caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. This is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve and mourn and wail and change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. We're going to go through this text verse by verse over the next two weeks. We're going to deal with the first three verses today. We'll deal with the last three, the last four verses next Sunday. 
Because as we go through this verse by verse, what we'll recognize is there's an intimacy that God is calling us to, but there is an adultery that keeps us from it. There is an intimacy that God is calling us to, but there is an adultery that keeps us from it. This is why James starts with this text. Put that up for me, BJ. This is why he starts right here in this fourth verse. Oh, he begins this in such a, such a brutal way, you adulterous people. He says this because, you know, in the Old Testament scriptures, God often refers to himself in his conversations with Israel as himself as a husband and Israel as an unfaithful wife. And he does that because he's saying, Israel, as much as I love you, as much as I've cared for you, as much as I've protected you, as much as I've carried you, as much as I've done everything that I could for you, still you betray me and worship these false gods. They've never done anything for you. It's always been me. And every chance you get, you fix your gaze on some new good-looking God that can't even talk. So God refers to Israel often as adulterous because the Bible pictures God as a husband with his people as the bride. The New Testament scriptures are no different. The New Testament scriptures call the church the bride of Christ. So when James makes this statement, you adulterous people, he's saying, see, your attention is not on the one who really loves you. That in some way, you are turning your gaze from the one who truly cares about you. And then he gets specific. <laughs> Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God, this friendship that he's talking about is a closeness. It's an intimacy. It's a dependence. Some of you guys have friends who you're close to, who you have an intimate friendship. You share some of everything. You share some of your deepest and darkest secrets. You may share things with them that you wouldn't share with anybody else. You may depend on them in a time of need like you depend on nobody else. And see, this is what James is talking about. James is saying, see, you're not fixing your gaze on the one who truly loves you. Instead, you're getting close to and having some dependency and friendship with this world. Now, when you see the word world in the scriptures, I need you to understand what you're looking at. Because the world, the term is used to describe these beliefs and these values and these ways that are not of God. Let me, let me say it again. When the scriptures use the term the world in this kind of context, it's talking about beliefs and values and ways whose origins are not heaven. Ooh, ooh, Lord. Oh. <clears throat> Marriage is established by God. It's been established by him. He, he created it. Do you realize that? Marriage is sacred. Sacred meaning came from God. He's the origin of marriage. <sighs> Politics comes from the world. That didn't come from heaven. You see the difference? So whenever you see that term, the world, bring that back up, BJ. We're going we're gonna to stick with that for a minute. Whenever we see the world, we're talking about these beliefs and these values and these ways that don't come from God. So that James is saying here, see, you're fixing your gaze and you're giving your love and attention and you're becoming dependent and close to all of these things that don't come from God. All of these beliefs, 
All of these values, all of these ways that don't come from God. Now, here's the problem. Most of what we believe in the world that doesn't come from God, we think originates with us. So this idea about worshiping the universe, we think, okay, that's something we came up with. Sounds good. Using crystals to pray and sage to clean your home and all this other type of stuff. See, we think that we've come up with this, that this is our grand idea. That everything that doesn't come from God, we assume comes from us. But here is the real problem. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 4 says this. The God of this age... In some versions, it says the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The challenge that we have is the beliefs and the values and the ways of the world that we think come with us, come from us with some degree of wisdom and experience that the years as we've evolved in our thinking have come to be. In reality, these things truly come from a different source. And the source is Satan, the God of this world. So to be clear, James is saying, you people who your gaze and your attention, your love and your focus is on and in this friendship with the world, with this set of beliefs and values that truly come from the enemy. If that's the case, he's saying this means that you have enmity against God. That word enmity is an interesting word. What's weird is that, number one, we don't use the word enmity anywhere today. Nobody says, yo, you and I, we got enmity. No, nobody's, nobody says that. And oddly, in many of the modern translations of the Bible, they still use the word enmity, but it means hatred, hatred, hostility, animosity, opposition. So to be clear, James is saying, see, if we have this friendship with the world, it means that we have hatred, hostility, animosity, opposition against God. And the reason is because all of the ideas and values and beliefs that come here come from someplace else, from one who is actually in hatred and opposition and hostility, and animosity toward God. Does this make sense? See, some of y'all who at least you, you have some understanding of the streets, you, you actually understand this concept. I remember when, when um, I remember there was, oh, I try not to say names, but sometimes you need the name to tell the story properly. Uh, I remember 50 Cent was talking about the beef that he had with Fat Joe. Do those names ring some bells for some people? Some of y'all sitting in here talking about who's 50 Cent and who's Fat Joe. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but 50 Cent was talking about the beef that he had with Fat Joe. And originally him and Fat Joe were good. The problem is Fat Joe went and made that song with Jadakiss and Ja Rule. Now, the problem is 50 Cent had problems with Jada Kiss and Ja Rule. So 50 Cent's mind in terms of the street is, well, the person who's the enemy or the friend of my enemy is also my enemy. Like we might have been good, but you went and got close to them, which means now you're a target as well. Do you know God feels the same? I'm not saying that God responds the same. (laughs) To be clear, I'm just saying. Not that God responds the same, but he feels the same. For God, if you're down with the world, you're obviously against me. That's what this says. See, therefore, anyone who chooses, oh, this is, this is a, oh, this, oh, this is a heartbreaking word. Because this means you weren't forced, you weren't coerced, 
You weren't tricked. You chose. So therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Can we be reminded that Jesus said similar things? Very gangster mentality. Jesus said, if you're not for me, hello. It's the same concept. Same concept. All right. Let's look at what else this text says. This, and this is, <laughs> this, is, this is why this is such a problem. Oh, can you imagine? <sighs> imagine what it would be like if someone that you loved deeply chose to leave you and love someone who hated you. Can you imagine? Someone who you love, who you've sacrificed for, who you've given everything to. Someone who you've provided for and protected and carried. They left you to love somebody who hates you. This is why the, the next scripture says what it says. Because look at what it says. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he caused to dwell in us. I want to be clear about something here because I know many of you use different versions of the Bible. And, and so, you know, the King James Version doesn't say longs for the spirit he caused to dwell in us. And this is a lowercase s. And I teach you guys when you see lowercase s, this is the spirit that God breathed into you that gives you life. Well, the King James actually uses an uppercase S, and it says that the spirit longs in jealousy. It's the same thing, though. The outcome is the same. Listen, whether God, the Father, is yearning in jealousy for your attention or affection, or for whether, whether the Holy Spirit God put in you is yearning for your attention and affection, it's the same thing. Do you see what I'm saying? It's the same thing. So no matter what translation you come to, still, this is the problem. And mind you, we are persons because God is a person. When I say person, I mean complete with feelings and emotions. He hates. He loves. He has joy. He has anger. He gets jealous. And the real problem is, because God is holy and righteous and just, his jealousy is warranted. The, the text tells us why. He jealously longs for the spirit he caused to dwell. Oh, come on. Come on, y'all. He gave you life. The world didn't give you no life. The universe didn't give you no life. The universe didn't share nothing with you. When you needed something, the universe didn't come calling. When you were down and in pain and you were crying because of betrayal, you didn't, go, you didn't run up and grab and hug no crystal. When you're in your deepest and your darkest hour, nobody could come to you except God, the one who created you. And since he created you, he jealously longs for your attention and your affection. He wants you to fix your gaze on him. When what he created and what he loves to the degree where he gave his son when what he loves turns its affection to someone else, even more so to someone who hates him. He's jealous. Everybody in this room has been in a place where you have been jealous. Listen. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh. 
I remember, I remember this happened to me twice, and it only happened on buses. This is weird. I remember when I was 10, my grandmother used to have this organization, this club that was at her church called the Get Up and Go Club. All right, it was some older women from the church who they planned trips all over the place. And I remember one year they planned a trip to Washington, D.C. I was 10 years old. We were on a bus. So there were uh, another, a number of these church mothers brought their grandchildren. So my grandmother brought me, and there was my friend Baron. There was another friend, Mike, and his, their grandparents, their grandmothers were on the bus. And then there was this young girl on the bus, somebody's granddaughter. And me, Baron, and Mike were all looking at her like, mm. Now, when I was 10, I, I had to be at least four feet. By, <laughs> by the time I was 14, I was maybe four foot nine. So I'm, I think I'm the youngest one out of all of them. And we all liked her and we all told her that we liked her. And while we were on our trip to D.C., she was going to choose one of us to be her boyfriend. Don't you know? <laughs> it wasn't Ronnie. <laughs> when I was in Los Angeles and I was, I was in middle school and I was a part of a magnet program, so I lived in K-Town. I lived in Koreatown. And, but I went to school in Brentwood. And for those of you who know L.A., Brentwood, I went to school with celebrities' kids. I went to school with Rosie Greer's son, Bing Crosby's son, like Bing Crosby's grandson, rather, and some other people. And so I took a bus out to Brentwood because K-Town was the hood. So on the bus, there was a young lady on the bus who I liked. And then there was, uh, uh, there was this uh, Taiwanese kid on the bus who he liked her too. It wasn't Ronnie. <laughs> But I remember the heartbreak. Like, I remember feeling like it's not me. Like, I like her, but it's not me. Why does he get to have her, right? Every one of you has had a situation in life where you felt that kind of jealousy. But often our jealousy is not warranted because we didn't create these people who we love. We haven't sacrificed anything for them or given anything to them. But God is different. And he's jealous when we turn our attention to the world. Because the reality is, is we turn our attention to the world and we're close to the world. We're turning our attention to one who hates our God. Yeah. Yeah. So this text is written to elicit a response in this foundational truth. He's jealous for what he created. He's jealous for what he created. It belongs to him. You know, many of us know that if we were to claim to love someone the way that we claim to love God, we wouldn't be able to treat them the way that we often treat God. I'm going to say that again. Many of us know that if we claimed to love someone the way that we claim to love God, we would also not be able to treat them the way we often treat God. We often treat God some like he doesn't exist. Some treat him like he exists, but that he doesn't matter. Some treat him like he exists, but like they don't need him. Some treat him like he exists, but that like he's like a genie in the bottle who grants wishes. And we know that if we claim to love someone else, and treated them like that, it wouldn't fly. But we often treat God this way. And what's shameful about that is there's no one whose love for us is more pure than his. There's no one who loves us the way he does. 
There's no one who's ever sacrificed more. There's no one who's ever given more. There's no one who you've ever offended and they forgave you more. In spite of that, look at this next verse. (laughs) No, not that one. (laughs) But he gives us more grace. Oh, so some of you guys have heard me mention this before. I've never, I've never really taught about it specifically, I don't think. For those of you who don't know and have never read the book of Hosea, raise your hand if you're familiar with Hosea. Okay, there's a lot of people who are, but there are some who are not. Hosea is a prophet who God calls to a very unique ministry. Hosea is a prophet, and God wants to use him prophetically in a way that he's never used anybody else before. God calls for Hosea to marry a promiscuous woman. God says to Hosea, this is what I need you to do. Because God is saying, I'm trying to communicate with Israel, and I'm trying to communicate a truth to Israel, and I think that your life can display this truth. So he says, Hosea, I want you to marry this woman right here. And the woman that he's requiring Hosea to marry is promiscuous. She's loose. She doesn't love anybody, but she'll sleep with everybody. God says, marry her. Hosea is a good prophet. <laughs> hey. He talk about obedience to the Lord. He obeys and he marries this woman. And she does exactly what God knew that she would do. Hosea wasn't a fool. He knew too. She cheats on Hosea often. In fact, when Hosea starts to have kids, there's even a question like, are these really mine? And God commands Hosea to give these kids weird names. I'm serious. He commands Hosea to give names like, um, you're not faithful. <laughs> like, what is God trying to do through Hosea? He's trying to tell Israel, hey, this is what you're doing to me. I'm a husband who's faithful and who loves you. And you run around with every other God. You're unfaithful to me, even though I've always been there for you. Now, one moment in Hosea's ministry, and this is the one that really gets me, and this is the one that fits with our text. At one moment, this, at one moment, this promiscuous woman leaves Hosea to go be with some other dude. You know what God tells Hosea the prophet? Go get her. <laughs> Listen, God would have to speak hard and long. <laughs> I'd be like, not the RZA. I don't know, God. I don't don't know, Lord. (laughs) And God, when he tells Hosea to go get her, what he's saying is go get her, pay a price for her. Wait, what? She's mine in the first place. You saying I got to pay this dude for what belongs to me? Why do you think Jesus gave his life? God is foreshadowing the new covenant. So he says to Hosea, go get her, pay a price for her, bring her back, continue to love her. Wait a minute. I can't even bring her home and knock her over once? Like, I'm not condoning condoning any domestic violence. (laughs) I'm just saying, you you gotta admit that in the mind, you're thinking, she's just, she left me To be with some other dude, God, you're saying I got to go get her and pay for her and bring her home and like her? But isn't that what God does? What? What? But he gives us more grace. Huh? How many times have you turned your attention from the Lord? 
to bask your eyes and some other parts of your body into the world's glory. Only to come away from that feeling shame and saying to God, forgive me. And since he already paid a price, he doesn't bring you back in and knock you down. He gives you more grace. Doesn't he treat us this way? He does over and over again. So then James says, that is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives favor to the humble. I want you to recognize something. One of the greatest deterrents to our relationship with God is our pride. I want you to understand that pride comes in two different forms, and one of the forms has many subforms. Here, here's what I mean. So, number one, there's the pride that comes from what you have. So, there's a pride that, you know, let's say, for instance, that a person is attractive from society's standpoint, and they feel that what they have in their physical beauty puts them above others. Or someone has great intellect and they've been educated well and they feel that their intellect and their education that they have puts them above others. Or the car that they drive, the money they make allows them to drive a particular car that makes them feel like they are above others. Or the clothes that they wear makes them feel that they are above others. It's about possessions. Now, mind you, James chapter 4 Starting from verse number one, this is where we have the conversation about you have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motive that you might spend what you get on your own pleasures. James is talking about possessions there. He's saying you guys are killing each other and you're arguing because you lust after what each other has. And he's saying all of this is rooted in a pride of possession. But there's another type of pride. The second type of pride is the pride that says, I don't need anyone. I can do it all on my own. This becomes a challenge if anyone includes God. And this is where many of us are. Let me, let me, let me say it to you this way. <laughs> There's likely not one of us in this room who would ever say out loud, I don't need God. It's not, if, if you have like half a sense, <laughs> you would not be caught saying out loud, I don't need God. That's cool. However, there are many people who, although they don't, they don't say it, they live it. Now, I did a series in 2021 called A Match Made in Heaven. And in that series, I was talking about lining up our lives with the truths that God speaks about us in heaven. And one of the statements I made in that series was, what you believe and what you live will never be different. Although what you say you believe and what you live can be drastically different. However, what you live will always be evidence of what you really believe. So there are people, lots of folks, who would never say they don't need God, but they live their lives apart from God's wisdom all the time. Who in their lives are basically saying, I don't need you, Lord. Y'all, it's just quiet in here, y'all. I got some agreement down here, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, any time that the scriptures say, do this, and we say, but I'm going to do that. You're saying, I don't need you, God. 
Anytime the scriptures say, don't do that. And you're saying, but I'm going to do this. You're saying, I don't need you, God. You're saying, God, I think I know a way that's better than yours. Y'all are quiet. I don't care. These are facts. Listen, if, it's, if, it's, if, if, if I'm stepping on your toes, hallelujah. Amen. So in this text, what he's saying is, see, God gives us more grace. And then he refers to this, God opposes the proud. And so he's saying, see, those who are caught up in the idea that they don't need God, humility can get you to the place where you can have this grace. Isn't that how we come to it? It, it is. It's, it's, it's you realize you messed up. You know you messed up. So instead of pretending like you don't have to make up for that with the Lord, it's, ah, I don't care, I messed up. Instead, you go to the Father. And I pray that you do so in a way that's reverent and honorable. And that you say, God, I did it again. And I'm sorry. And God, I'm trying as I'm struggling with this issue. Will you help me? Humility. That's humility. God, I know you're right. And I messed up. And I can't do it without you. And what is his response? More grace. See, this is what James is teaching in this moment. We, we need to stop right here uh, because next week we really get into the rest of this text that speaks specifically into how we access this grace. Because, family, the reality is there's an intimacy with God to be had, but adultery's got to end. Our friendship with the world has to end. Our allowing the devil to co co-opt us has got to end for greater intimacy with God. And we're going to talk next week all about how we get there.